thank you very much. I'm Mike. Uh, I work for Conducts Context Industrial Security. Uh, and I'm doing bad USB style vulnerabilities for control systems. Let's see if I can get this guy. There we go. All right, first, what's bad USB? If you don't know what it is, all right, get out from underneath your rock, all right? It, it happened in August of 2014. Um, basically, the idea is, is that you turn peripherals bad. You could maliciously reprogram firmware in USB-based devices to make them do things that were against the function that you had been told they were supposed to do. And so this was demonstrated at Black Hat and demonstrated at another conference as well by SR Labs. Um, I happened to have heard about this while I was doing some work um, in a very interesting place. Um, I actually work right now on contract in a highly regulated data diode environment. Um, if it, and if you get me uh, a couple more beers, I'll probably tell you a little bit more about it. Um, I didn't like that laugh. Um, bad USB is kind of our boogeyman because when you don't spend all of your time watching your ingress points, because you don't have any ingress points, and you don't modify any firewall rules because you don't have any external firewalls, all right? You don't have to, and, you don't, and you're not patching your systems based on what's coming into your network. You, you tend to take a look at the other ways into your network. And one of our main ways is through USB-based devices. And so this is our boogeyman in this area. So a little bit of background on me. I'm a professional engineer. I'm registered in Missouri. Uh, I worked for a top five power engineering firm, Burns and McDonald, for six years, doing compliance and security and electric power. Then I went to go work at a utility uh, and assisted in the security of several power plants in North America. After that, I went to go work at Digital Bond and started owning stuff a lot more. And so now I've started out on my own. So here we go. On with the show. Um, Going to give you a little bit of a setup here. We have lots of bare serial systems in industrial control. So in other words, that old nine pin thing that you see and that you every once in a while pull out in order to work on a switch or maybe reset a password on a Cisco, something like that. And just to let you know some of the characteristics of this, it's, it's in industrial systems, we connect directly to our critical hardware via serial port, all right? It's not via ethernet, all right? The way you would like a, a normal router or something like that. We go direct serial. Um, we trust these connections a lot more than we do Ethernet, all right? When chosen, we will actually go the Ethernet route, or excuse me, we'll go the serial route rather than going the Ethernet route whenever we're doing configuration for these systems. So we do this with whatever we happen to have at the time. Now, and, and it's basically completely insecure. If you think about your normal Cisco uh, setup, it's just basically Telnet over two wires. And so that's what I was thinking of when I heard about bad USB. I was sitting at my desk and I was working on a bunch of laptops that we use to reconfigure protective relays and that we use to configure PLCs and that we use to do with that. And I'm thinking about it, I'm going, well, gee, how do we do this? None of our computers have got serial ports. Well, we use serial to ethernet conversion. This is just some of the stuff that uses serial ports. So our normal bad USB model, we have a malicious USB device. It's nasty, it's ugly, all right? It does all kinds of fun things. You plug it into a system and then it owns that system. And it does whatever it wants to with that system. And then it starts spreading to other important systems because you're gonna move that USB device from system to system to system. That, that's what was described, that's what we're all scared of. That's how this whole thing worked. Now the thing that we have in control systems is that it's different. So I'm gonna put it into context for you. We have a malicious USB to serial converter we plug it in via USB and it doesn't do anything to our system. Because you know what? That's not the important system. That's not the piece that runs the plant. Now that other side though, that DB9 side, that serial RS-232 side, that runs the plant. That does bad things. And so we're concerned about that because it goes straight to our critical automation equipment. That goes to pumps, that goes to turbines, that goes to other stuff. And so show me the product that can detect something like this if it's not showing up on the USB side. So when I heard about this, I decided, well, I'm gonna put out uh, some funds. In other words, I'm gonna break out the beer money and we're gonna go buy a bunch of USB to serial converters. So I picked them up, all right? We picked up 10 from eBay. I figured, hey, there are a bunch of automation engineers that might wanna pick up a bunch of cheap stuff. eBay seems like a good place, why not? And then I picked up another 10 from some reputable manufacturers. Some of them pretty expensive, I might add. 
ripped them apart, analyzed the chips, took a look at it, pulled data sheets, all right, went through, went through user forums, looking for all the different ways that these chips could be used, all the different implementations, all the different ways that they could potentially be reprogrammed in a bad USB style. Classified them and now hopefully I'm going to give some recommendations. We'll see how good they are. So a little bit of an aside, this is my disclosure. Hi, this is my disclosure. I didn't talk to anybody. This is more of a public service announcement. This has been out for a while. All right, August 2014, I didn't see any real need in saying, hey, we've got a USB device that's vulnerable to bad USB. I mean, we know this. So if nobody did anything about it, is it, I, I don't really consider it that big of a deal. So, but I'm not gonna mention any specific vendors, that's impolite. If you happen to recognize something, great, it means you work in automation and that you're kind of concerned about it. If you don't, well, I'm gonna be doing disclosure and I'm gonna be doing more work on it later. If you follow ICS cert and other things like that, you'll probably see something in the next couple of months. I will mention the chip vendors. These guys should know better. These guys should know their chips inside and out and should be concerned about this. And at the very least, should be coming up with new products and should be putting them out on the street. So yes, I am gonna talk about specific chips. It also helps too if you happen to have a USB to serial converter in your environment and you wanna see if there's a potential that it's vulnerable. So it wasn't as bad as I thought which is really sad because I was hoping to get up here and be like, everything's owned. All right, be, be horribly afraid. We had one that was really vulnerable. Um, and actually we have three that are weak, not two, that's a typo. And then we had two that were fake, uh, in other words, counterfeit chips. And then the rest were basically from my point of view, invulnerable. Uh, they weren't programmable in any way, shape or form. So you couldn't change their underlying function through the USB port. Now you could do it in another way, but I was most concerned about the USB port style attack because so long as I've got physical control over it, do I really care so much if it can be reprogrammed through some complicated JTAG process? All right, so chips found, vulnerable. We had an Infineon processor. Uh, that guy was definitely capable of having new firmware thrown on him. Uh, there's a tool and everything. I'll go into that in a sec. Weak, we had the TIT USB 3410, which is a neat little processor that you can stick uh, into a USB cable that does translation between USB and serial. We had invulnerable stuff. These guys got lucky, or maybe they're just good. I don't know. But the Atmega UCs, they were initially considered vulnerable when I took a look at them, but then the board design itself prohibited USB-based reprogrammability. So yes, you can reprogram them by some other method, but you can't just stick them into a computer and they're gonna get reprogrammed without your knowledge. And then after that, a whole bunch of stuff that if you've done any um, hardware hacking, making work, any work on Atmega, if you follow Hackaday, if you go to Adafruit, anything like that, you're gonna run into on a pretty regular basis, except for that CH342, 340T chip. And then I had an old Radio Shack device and a ridiculous eBay purchase that I will be happy to show you. Uh, that doesn't even do USB to serial conversion, it's just a bunch of chips thrown on a die um, that were fake. So first up, this is the one I found the most interesting. It is fully reprogrammable. It has inside of it right now, uh, excuse me, it, obviously it has inside of it right now, but it has inside of it an Intel 8051, 8052 based microcontroller. All right, I learned on this in college. This was a 101 class for me. So. I'm looking at this and I'm going, wow, I get to pull out all my old college books. Tutorials, code, all of it's available. In fact, the 8051 style stuff was some of the first stuff that Carson Knoll brought up in his bad USB talk. So I was like, okay, this is a good segue, why not? There are two modes of actually having this uh, be updatable. One is that you get firmware from the host, i.e. the system that you plug into. So you plug in this device and it says, hey, give me firmware. And the device goes, hey, here's your firmware. I bet you can imagine what happens next. And then there's firmware from a chip. Well, if you see down in the lower right-hand corner there, there's room for a couple of chips. They don't exist on this. So this particular one doesn't have the capability to load from chip. You have to load from the host that you're plugging into at that particular time. Next one up was the Atmegas. Like I said, these were invulnerable due to the design of the boards. This is pretty cool. Uh, that's one of the best boards I've ever seen uh, on the left. 
uh, at least from its era. This is around 2006 is when this thing is from. And then on the right is another similar one. So these are general purpose microcontrollers. They've got user upgradable firmware. There is a capability to upgrade via USB. The way that it's connected to the system keeps it from doing that. So it's like night and day between these two chips. You'll, you'll see another one here in a sec too. This Infineon is a something. I got no idea what it is. There are no data sheets on it. It's not a public based um, chip, but it's used in industrial automation all over the place. So if you recognize this chip, if you get concerned, take a look inside your USB to serial converter, pull it open, and if you see this chip, well, you know what, you should probably call, contact your vendor. All right, you can mention my name in vain, I don't mind. So, but there is a firmware updater. That's what we're looking at right here. This is the screen for that. So if you wanted to, you could give it another set of firmware. I don't know how deep this rabbit hole goes because I couldn't get it to work. Uh, the one that I had, I didn't have the equipment to get it to up and running. It required a separate power supply. So, lots of frustration, lots of wasted hours on this one. I really don't want to look at it again. All right, so while I'm going through this, I had to constantly remind myself, chip markings can lie, and they will lie badly. Uh, there have already been several public cases about PL2303 chips, which are prolific, uh, and FTDI chips, all right, as well as a couple of others, but those are the two main ones, of being counterfeited in China. Now, all this is being counterfeited due to money. So if they were actually building in capability for bad USB, they're spending more money on their side, they would have to bump the cost up on their side, thus making it a bad business process. So that's, that's good. That's market forces right there. Um, it is very difficult to determine programmatically whether or not a chip has been faked or not. They build these fakes so that they're pin compatible. They look almost exactly identical. FTDI got pretty lucky um, during FTDI gate where they were able to detect the chips programmatically and then they bricked them. All right, they turned them into big, you know, nasty piles of, of silicon with 0000 as their PID, which basically turns them out of Windows. You can't use them anymore. So anyway, uh, the more interesting one was the TUSB 3410. Um, once again, 8051 style stuff. So what you're seeing up at the top, this is an actual capture of the firmware that I pulled out of the installation. So this is what is actually sent to the microcontroller when you plug in the USB device. So plug it in, it says, hey, give me firmware, and the host goes, yes, sir, here's your firmware. And this is what it should send. All right, it's literally a file on the device for this particular microcontroller. And then at the bottom, I use USB PCAP, which is a separate add-on to Wireshark that allows you to sniff traffic on the USB bus. And so I pulled that down and I took a look at it and I was like, oh, that looks really similar, except for the first three bytes. So the first three bytes there are how big the firmware is, that's the first two bytes. So in other words, there's an upper limit on how much you can stick in this thing. And then that AD is actually an 8-bit checksum. So in other words, the only thing checking on the, and, and this right there was the best part, because I actually found that in the data sheet. The only thing that's checking on the microcontroller side, on the USB converter side, to see if it's valid firmware is just that a checksum matches. That's it. There's no signature, there's no signed code, there's no hash, there's nothing like that. So it's all based on the host. Okay. So we tried to do some fun things. So up at the top is the, um, is the capture from when I, just a normal capture. So I plug it in, I capture what's going out from between the host and the USB device, and it just goes through. And as you can see right there, there's a something something technologies uh, company limited. That's a string within the firmware. And so I went, well, gee, that's, that's quite, quite handy. And so I yanked the uh, file that I'd been looking at earlier and I changed it. So yeah, Michael Tucker was here is now what it is. And it will actually accept with this string. I just edited the file and it goes straight out to the USB controller and it ran fine. All right, so that means I can update firmware through this particular piece. In other words, I can put my own code out in that device. Think about that for a moment. You have your host computer, you have your USB to serial controller, and then you've got something that configures relays. Hmm. Now you have a device in the middle, standard man in the middle attack. You have an insecure protocol between the two. You can now do whatever you like with this thing. How many of you have configured a Cisco switch or a Cisco router? Just raise your hands. All right. What would happen if you were to like listen in between that connection while you were doing it 
for, I don't know, maybe the set password command. And you were to just, oh, okay, I'm gonna set password, I'm gonna grab whatever's there, and then I'm gonna add my own user account right underneath. Then you have a user account on that thing. Let's say, for instance, that you hop out of configure and you go, hmm, I'm gonna do a DNS lookup with a specific address that tells somebody else what that new password and username is. And now suddenly you have the capability to get out and tell people, hey, your modification has done something. We'll now expand that into critical infrastructure. All right. And forgive me for the speed on this one. So let me go back here for a sec. Okay, so go through quickly what, what's possible. Now I need to understand the world, the sky's not falling here. All right, this firmware only loads once. You unplug it, you plug it back into another computer, it's gonna look for the driver again and it's gonna have to load another set of firmware. So there's capability to detect what was going on at that point if you're looking for it. Now the ones that come with reprogrammable firmware, maybe yes, maybe no. All right, so what's our conclusion of mitigation? So once you find out about this kind of stuff in a highly regulated environment, they get a little annoyed at you and they say, well, what can we do about it? And I said, well, let's stop using USB to serial converters. Let's start getting laptops that actually have an integrated <coughs> serial port, all right, something that we can actually watch, something that we can you know, evaluate all the drivers for, that we can ensure and we can use whitelisting for. Know what's inside your device. Take a look at it, all right? If you've got something that's between you and your critical information, or, and your critical infrastructure, Pull it open, see what's inside, see if anything in there worries you. All right, that might be an important thing. Use alternative methods. Sometimes there are better ways to do things. Um, a lot of new PLCs, a lot of new controllers, a lot of new stuff will actually be configurable over ethernet. If you have a security infrastructure, that's something you can monitor. That's something you can watch. Hey, hey right on time. That's something you can watch. There is a risk versus reward here that you're gonna have to go through, all right? This isn't a, you know, just use Ethernet for everything and oh, by the way, run it out to the Internet recommendation. This is figure out what your actual risk is, figure out what the reward is. And that after, after all of these things, if you have to use it, track it and audit it. You can use firmware dumping tools such as JTAG, I2C, and others to pull firmware. You can evaluate it up against the manufacturer recommendations. All right, using hashes, they don't even have to give you any intellectual property. Billy Rios has got a great project up and running right now at icswhitelist.com where he's trying to collect a lot of this stuff so that when you go through and you do forensic analysis or when you need to check this kind of thing, you can actually say, oh yes, this is the actual firmware for this system. And I'm gonna be uploading all of the good firmware that I found uh, once I'm done with this presentation to icswhitelist.com. Um, USB's traffic sniffing and analysis, this was extremely helpful. It was very easy to see um, what was going on. These are all very simplistic protocols. They're not implementing the full USB stack. You're not having to look at all the USB uh, special firmware update capabilities. These controllers just don't handle them very well. And then check the hashes of signatures of vital firmware whenever you do any updates or whenever certain things change. And certainly don't let people bring in, if you're extremely concerned about this threat factor, don't let people bring in their own stuff. Provide them with stuff to use instead. So, any questions? I'm on Twitter. Um, I don't know if I've got any time or not. Uh, no. It's not really. One minute. Michael, oh, that's okay. Thank you very much, Michael, for your great presentation.